In this morning's message, and and referring to first uh, last week's message, many of you have asked about that. And once again, when the Holy Spirit moves, the enemy also moves. And we had about five different problems with the computer and the sound and the recording. So neither message got recorded uh, from last Sunday. So please pray as the new equipment arrives and is installed and that the Lord would just protect us from that spiritual warfare that, that is taking place. Okay? But this, this morning's message is in many ways a continuation of last week as it's all one thought, that one teaching that all comes together and it sort of climaxes in what we're going to talk about this morning. But first, before we continue, let's pray, commit this time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for laughter. We thank you for joy in Christ that, Lord, you are our King and that you are, Father Lord Jesus, in all your splendor and majesty, sitting on your throne. And the angels right now are seeing glory, glory to God in the highest. They are praising you. They are worshiping you. They are, Lord, proclaiming your wonderful attributes and the good news of the gospel. And so, Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, because that is our true reality. This earth is not our home. I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts up to your word through your Holy Spirit. This is not the words of man, but it is your word divinely inspired by you. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would leave changed, different than how we came in this morning. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. So, this topic is on supernatural contentment and divine provision. That word contentment is the secret for being happy as a Christian. Amen? How many believers do you know that you could honestly say they're just happy people? When you go to church, in any main church, I'm not talking about on Sunday morning, but during the week, you can honestly say, man, they're just truly happy people. Do you feel like you're truly a happy, content person? And I, and I hope and pray that you do feel like that. Because Paul teaches a great deal of, uh, of truth what it means to be content in Christ. But first, before we begin to read the passage in Philippians, I would like to read from 1 Timothy 6, 3-10. through 10. And why, why are we going to read this? Because when we have plenty, we tend to complain. And when we lack, we tend to fear and to doubt. If there's any... Uh, illustration that would be the best illustration to show a lack of contentment, it would be Israel leaving Egypt and going into the desert. Amen? Their lack of contentment is a lesson to each and every one of us and the consequences the lack of contentment will produce in our life. So once again, what is the secret to live a happy life in Christ? It is to be content. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 10. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. These are theological debates inside the church. This is what's really interesting that Paul makes here. And constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. So, life that is happy is a simple life. Amen? Paul only mentions two things. Clothes and food. Do all of you have those right now? Yes. So if there's not a contentment in Christ, there is something wrong. Go back to the, what we talked about last week in Philippians. I'm not thinking upon that which is good, noble, just, lovely, worthy of praise, that which is excellent. I'm thinking about what Paul is just going to mention here. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs or many afflictions. 
So people that are not content, what do they do? They hurt themselves. There is never enough. Does Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, do they ever have enough? Do the politicians that are multi, multi multi-millionaires from being politicians, do they ever have enough? There is no end because that is their world. That is their God. They are never content. The very fact that they got fraudulently President Trump kicked out and now they want to impeach him tomorrow morning shows that what? They are never content in their evil desires. There is no end to them. And so we see all that. We see the money in Big Sky. Do not think that all the money in Bozeman is not going to affect you when you don't have what they have. It will affect you because you see it every single day. When you're living in a house that, that maybe is just a very, very basic house and you're working in a house that cost $10 million, is that going to affect your mindset? That is a huge difference. And, and, and yet you, you can think, you know, oh, well, if I had this, I'll be more content. Well, Paul's teaching and, and his attitude in life is amazing. And once again, if we don't understand this secret, and it is a secret, and it's something that all of us do not have automatically. And there are some key verbs in here that Paul uses to teach us that. But let's go ahead and read Philippians 4, 10 through 19. Philippians 4, 10 through 19. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have, underlined this in your Bibles, learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Two-year-olds have not learned that lesson, have they? Five-year-olds, no. Teenagers still haven't learned it. College students, well, some of them are getting there. But it's something learned. To be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances I have learned the secret. That's an important word. The secret of being filled and going hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And is it that one of the most abused verses in all the Bible? Yes, it is. People take it out of context all the time because they don't know their Bible. That only means Christ strengthening me to be content by his strength, by his power. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Why is this such an important passage? You think, well, I, I'm not in full-time ministry. I don't have these needs like the Apostle Paul that lived by faith every day, that lived off of the offering and donations of other people. What does this have to do with me? This has everything to do with you and me and our life in Christ. And here is one of the most important lessons you can learn in the Christian life. That God will not provide for you unless you are first content in Christ. If you don't learn that, you are going to suffer a lot of unnecessary evils in your life that God does not want you to suffer. But again, we will do this to ourselves just like wanting more and more riches, building our own kingdom. It's just like putting thorns in our own life. It will always produce more and more suffering. And I have preached and preached and tried to beg people and prayed in private for so many people over these years to put Christ's kingdom first in His righteousness and see them not do it. And to see God provide all the opportunity for them to serve and put His kingdom first and time and time again for those people 
They call themselves believers to reject it over and over again. So the first point is, contentment in Christ is a complete life. How many of you want to have successful lives in general? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone wants to have successful. No one says, no, Pastor Jared, I really want to be a failure in my life. And I have dreamed of that since I was a young child. (laughs) And yet by the very things people don't do in obeying God's word, they are exactly doing that. They are choosing failure over success. And that is why we need wisdom from God to choose the correct over the good. You're on your own most likely not going to choose things you think are bad. You're going to choose things that you think are good even though they don't fall correct of God's word. Under this, the first subpoint is contentment in every situation in life must be what learned. We are all students. No matter if you are 10 years old or you are 80 years old, you are and I am to be a learner. We are constantly learning and even unlearning things that are wrong to learn the correct, the right truths of God. Second, contentment with material possessions must be learned as well. That is something that is developed through character. And God does a lot of things that we don't like to build our character in Christ. Amen? To teach us contentment because otherwise we are going to become spoiled brats. And that is an automatic process. If God doesn't let us linger with hunger and with want, we become spoiled. We can have everything. Good health, a good job, a nice house, uh, nice things. Friends, family, and we are automatically going to look towards the negative, what we talked about last week. We are going to dwell on that one thing we don't have. If, again, I'm speaking in front of a lot of people, and 20 or 19 people say they loved it and it was a blessing in their life, and one person criticizes it, once again, I'm going to focus on that one criticism for weeks on end. The same happens with a complaining spirit when we're not content. We will focus on the one shirt we don't have. We will focus on the one pair of shoes that we don't have. Not me, but I know there's some people that will do that. Or that one thing in our house that, man, if I just got to remodel this, I would be content. If I just got to replace this in my car, I would be content. It's always one more thing and it never ends. And that shows a heart that's not content. And people think so much, if I just moved to Hawaii. (laughs) Well, (laughs) they're they're already there, so. (laughs) Every one of you is going to go out and buy a pineapple rosars right now and (laughs) stick it on your kitchen counter. At least I have pineapple. But... But after that time in Hawaii, and you, you live there a certain time, will, will you find something to complain about? Oh man, I can't stand, <laughs> they won't. I can't stand this rainy season. I can't stand the mosquitoes. I can't stand that I'm paying six, seven dollars for a gallon of milk. You'll find something to complain about, and all of a sudden, God's not good. He was good when he allowed you to move there, but no longer is he good Because you and I are quick to find something that we don't like. This is our sinful condition and it is a constant battle. Remember last week we talked about that Satan is on a constant attack of your joy and peace. The world is on a constant attack of your joy and peace. It is non-stop attack. And if we're not finding our contentment in Christ as Paul learned... That, that to the world this makes no sense. W- what does that mean? I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. That is becoming invincible in Christ. And I want you to write that phrase down. It is becoming invincible in Christ. No matter what happens, no matter who's in control of politics, no matter what the economy is doing, no matter what my family or friends are doing, I am truly content in Christ. That is a power 
the world has never known. That is a power that Satan and all the demons have never experienced because all Satan wanted was more and more the glory of God, right? He doesn't know what contentment means. And when he sends content, contentment in a Christian, he hates you more because it makes no sense to him how you can be content while you suffer. How you can rejoice when you've lost everything. He despises you even more because he knows that it's the power of Christ in you giving you that joy. Amen. And it's a joy. Do you realize and understand that Satan has never experienced joy? Because joy comes in Christ. And if he was there guarding and protecting the worship of God and he despised that because he wanted to be in that position receiving that glory, then he never knew what true joy was. And when he sees it in you and he sees it in me in Christ, it is something that he is so jealous of that God would bestow his image on you and not him. Because you and I received the image of God, amen? He didn't. He's an angelic being, but he was not created in the image of God. You and I were. And he hates you and I even more for that reason. This divine contentment is given through Christ's strength. Can you be content? <laughs> Look at the life of Job when you've lost everything. And he's saying, though you slay me, yet I will what? Okay, that is a definition of divine contentment. Here's another definition. Saul, David running from Saul when he was anointed the king. He had the rightful kingship. Saul needed to step down instead he was going after to kill David. And in my personal opinion, the greatest Psalms and the most spiritually close to Jesus that David was, was when he was running from Saul. Yet he was content in Christ. So David was an amazing example. <laughs> the best example, of course, is Jesus himself, that he said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He had nothing on this earth, and yet he was content because he always, always talked about his relationship with his heavenly Father. And that provided his contentment. And so I want to ask you, in your moments of being discontent, okay, how much time before you got to that point of being super complaining and critical did you spend in prayer? Okay, at four o'clock on a certain day, you are super critical and complaining and you just feel miserable and really discouraged. Before you got to that point at 4 o'clock on that certain day, how much time prior to that were you spending time of deep prayer and meditation before the Heavenly Father? Probably not, right? Because if you were, would have you gotten to that point of being so critical and complaining spirit? That is so easy for us to do. So number two, and this is the, the whole order of God is amazing to me. How God is perfect in the way He controls and runs the world and even our lives. Contentment rewarded with divine provision. So first off, Paul is talking about what? You lacked opportunity to give, but he said it didn't matter because I learned how to be content. So before God provided through the Philippians, remember that Paul is where? He is in jail. And he is writing about joy and rejoicing in Christ 13 times in this book. And Paul has learned contentment and then provision, divine provision through partnership comes into his life and then he becomes abundantly supplied. I want you to notice something. It says in verses 14 15 something very interesting. It's a negative that many times we skip over and we shouldn't skip over it. Nevertheless, you have all done well to share with me in my affliction. They're sharing, right? Through, through providing for his needs. They're carrying that burden to help Paul. You yourself also know, Philippians, that at first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, here it is, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. Out of all the work the apostle Paul did, all of his sufferings and being beaten and being whipped, being persecuted, all his sacrifice for the churches and planting Christ-centered churches, it was only the Philippians that provided for him that were in partnership of the gospel. 
Don't you think in the New Testament church, it would be all of them? Don't you think the Ephesians would have been a major supporter of the Apostle Paul after he spent so much time there? Out of all the mess and the pain and the chaos and the suffering that the Corinthian immature believers caused the Apostle Paul, don't you think that they would have been a faithful supporter? But yet Paul says, not any of them except you alone were partners with me in the gospel. And I look back and I read that and I think of Tanya and I's missionary uh, experience over the past 20 years. Very, very few churches were faithful. They talked a lot. They said and they promised a lot of things even in front of all the church members. After I would speak or, or preach or share about the ministry, they sure would promise a lot. And all the people would be like, yeah, yeah, we need to support their ministry. But the reality of what happened as years transpired was at many times very different. So the truth is, is that very few people are going to support you in life. And those that do, you really appreciate, don't you? And if everyone in the world supported you, would you really long for Christ? Would you really be content? Or would you quickly become spoiled? Think about how, and, and you've got to be honest with yourself, and you may not like what you're going to hear, but you know what, at this church, we don't worry about offending people. Amen? Because the more you worry about getting your feelings hurt, the more in bondage you are in. And the more miserable of a person you're going to become. So you should say, Pastor Jared, I want to be offended every Sunday. <laughs> Bring it, because I need it. And the hard-hitting messages that bring deep conviction to you are the ones God is going to use most to bring such significant, powerful change in your life. So be bold, be courageous. <laughs> There's three college students that came here several Sundays in a row. And they said, man, our friends invited us to go to another church or start going to another church. We haven't been there yet. But man, I'm so convicted by every single message I hear. And he was blown away by that. But not so blown away because he didn't come back. So that people recognize that conviction. And recognize, do you know what conviction does? It is such a gift of God because it keeps us from destroying ourselves. It keeps us from becoming our own worst enemy. And yes, you are your own worst enemy. And I am my own worst enemy. I don't need anyone's help to start complaining and being spoiled. After we're sick and we're suffering, we're like, oh Lord, if you just heal me, I'll, I'll be so much happier. And then a week goes by, a two weeks go by, and we all of a sudden forget that we were sick, right? We forget how much something in our bodies hurt us, and then all of a sudden we start complaining about something new. How many prayers has God answered in your life that you were desperate for? The salvation of a family member. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for years. And that family member finally came to Christ. And the very next day, after the day you're praising God, thanking the Lord, hope you are, the very next day you find something very quickly to start complaining about and being burdened and anxious about. For four or five years, it was that family member. Man, if it just, if God just answers my prayer, all of my life will be so different. And I'll be so happy because I won't have to worry about that family member going to hell any longer. And as soon as God answers that, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, and it never stops. There is a divine secret that God wants you and I to learn today, and that is He will never provide truly what you need until you are truly content in Christ. That contentment has to come first. All of you have bills, all of you have even some, some of you medical needs, relational needs, but if you do not find your contentment in Christ, whatever it is that, that, if it is provided for you, it may very well be a curse more than it is a blessing. How many times young people, young singles believe, not just girls, guys and girls believe, if I just find that godly man that will pick me up on his horse and take me off to the sunset, and he'll even make me dinner, my life will be complete. 
No, your life will be more miserable. Because you honestly believe that will satisfy you instead of Christ alone. Not just girls. Guys, guys will not admit it. But they think the same thing. When they go to college, they're thinking the exact same thing. They just are better at hiding it, right? And a little bit more rational at times. <laughs> at Moody Bible Institute, if a guy even looked at a girl, even though he was looking at some car behind the girl in the parking lot, the girl went back to her dorm and said, I think we're going to get married. <laughs> and I know because those girls would tell me that stuff. And then Tanya told me what girls in our dorm would say. I mean, half the girls in our dorm thought they were going to marry me. And I had no idea any of this. But such it is in the irrationality that comes into our life when we are not content in Christ. We tend to vicariously live through other people. And that is a blasphemy against God. If I only had what this person had, if I only had the marriage, if why does that guy have that girlfriend when I think I deserve that girlfriend and vice versa why did that girl get that guy you know I should be with that guy I deserve it far more than she does and our mind just keeps going and going and going if you are not content right here right now this Sunday morning that Jesus loves you he died on the cross and paid for your sins that his blood covers everything and washes your sins away and that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that one day you will be with Jesus in his arms and if that does not make you content and happy nothing, nothing will and how many people think oh, if we just had a larger church with more ministries uh, the sermons more powerful the worship more dynamic the leadership stronger and the marriage conferences even richer then my life would be content in Christ. You, you, are, you are putting your faith and trust on man's institutions instead of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you deserve what you're going to suffer. Because it's blasphemy. You are saying what man can create. If we just have all of this in our church, all the programs, and, and we get to this certain number, and, and the offering gets to this certain level, and we'll pay off all the buildings and and we'll do this and that and reach more and more people. Do you realize that pastors are some of the least content people on planet Earth? And I was thinking about this over the past couple days. And we're still a church plant. And for a brand new church, a church plant is usually a church plant for at least three years. And, I, and, I, and as I mentioned before with the Dave Ramsey in Tennessee Insta, uh, company, for Christian financial services, when I talked to one of their financial advisors, he said their church plant in Tennessee just became a church autonomous after seven years. And as I was thinking about this message, and I was thinking about this church, even as a church plant, I, I asked myself, I don't know if the Holy Spirit put it on my heart or not, but I was dwelling and meditating on our church, even as a young church, and most of you have become but true believers at this church, I thought, am I content with our church? And I quickly, by God's grace, was able to answer that question with a yes. Because I've seen Christ transform your hearts and lives. I've seen the power of the gospel and how many of you are so different than you were a year ago. Two years ago. And I don't think you remember how you were, do you? I do remember. I remember those long, long conversations, and I remember those long nights at two in the morning. You weren't there, I was just praying for you. <laughs> but I remember them, I don't forget them. I, f I remember your doubts and the lies that you were believing, the addictions that you were falling into, the struggles, the battles that, that many, many of you have had. And to see you walking in freedom in Christ, that you are no longer the same person. And, and you quickly forget that, don't you? I, I can quickly forget that. Instead of praising Jesus, wow, he is so different. She is so different. They were never happy before. Now they're always happy. Now there's such a blessing to be around. And before, not really. That's contentment in Christ, amen. And so, 
If I was up here and, and leading this church plant and I was not content with this church, is that of concern to you? Should it be a concern to you? Because it doesn't matter who's leading a church. Whoever that individual is must have his contentment truly in Christ. If he's not content in Christ Jesus with his identity in Christ, you all, it's just a matter of time, will be spiritually abused. You're just going to be used as, as pawns or instruments to fulfill some void, some emptiness in the leader's heart and his life. So that contentment needs to be seen in any church leader. It's identity. I am a son of the king. That's enough. If everyone leaves and abandons, it doesn't matter because I am content that I am a son of the king, that Jesus is my savior. Remember Paul said, if we have food and clothes, we shall be content. Once again, I'm going to repeat this because simplicity is gold in the Christian life. You have clothes. A lot of you have more than you need, right? Dave has plenty of Hawaiian shirts. He knew that was coming. He was just waiting. I could feel it in the spirit. He's like, I'm just kidding. It's like, he's Pentecostal. It, our pastor's doctrine is really off. We have food. We have clothes. In America... Everyone worries about food shortages and this, that happening and even semi-trucks getting into Bozeman. We have plenty of food. And we may not always have plenty of food. But Paul learned the secret of being hungry or being full. Here's what's interesting. When you eat a huge dinner and then you go to bed like an hour later, do you sleep as good as when your stomach is empty and you go to bed? Does your body actually rest more when your stomach is empty and you sleep? Scientifically, it does. Your body actually rests more when your stomach is empty. You go into a deeper sleep. But we automatically think, my stomach has to be always, always full. Here's what's interesting about fasting. Do you know after three days, just three days of fasting, your immune system completely re does a full restart? A complete restart. That's amazing how God has de designed us and our, how our bodies are to work. So Paul says he learned contentment. He learned even with material possessions, whether he had a lot or he had a little, he learned how to be content. He learned how to become invincible in Christ. He learned how to be content in any situation in life through Christ's strength. Then that partnership happened. God used partnership to provide for his needs. The Apostle Paul says, increased spiritual growth produced in the giver. This is very important. So the Philippian church grew in their maturity in Christ because they were concerned for Paul and they provided for Paul's needs. He felt loved and cared for that by that church. Amen. That strengthened him in the ministry. God uses the local body of Christ to strengthen those full-time ministers. And I pray that God always uses this church, but you're always concerned for those full-time ministers when they have need. And for us, that's not, that's not me at this moment, or Tani and I, by God's grace, God has fully supplied for our needs. But here's also what the Lord put on my heart this week. For those pastors in Colombia that are struggling, we need to realize what is the opportunity, what do they need? How do we meet that need? And I've been working hard and with the, the board to be able to try to raise funds and support those three Colombian pastors. And, and the month of January was the beginning of that support for those three men and those three men together. And Friday, all the Nicaraguan, almost all of the Nicaraguan leaders and the three new Colombian Petra pastors all met on Zoom to talk about ministry and get to know each other and hear each other's testimonies. I should have put the, the, the picture of that meeting on the screen because it was encouraging to see all their faces together and, of course, most of them meeting each other for the first time. And though, because of all the travel restrictions, I do not know if that's possible or how soon it will be before you meet them or they meet you, but I pray that we, that we as a church pray uh, because with all their needs, I want to restart what, how we started ministry in Colombia 
of providing money for, for evangelism projects there. It was $100 for each of the five churches, a total of 500 per month. And, and I want you all to pray and seek the Lord to say, if that, out of our offering every month, if that's what God would want, to use 500 of that to go to those evangelism projects. Because when we did it for that short time, in 2020, people did come to Christ. And it did greatly encourage the pastors there that don't have much encouragement. So please be praying about that, okay? Please ask the Lord, Lord, is that what you would have us to do to supply their needs and to help them do what you called them to do? After this, the last worship flows through financial offering and sacrifice. It's, uh, Paul says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So a total of two times. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases your account. That means their spiritual well-being. But I have received everything in full and of an abundance. And I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma. And here, here it is. An acceptable sacrifice. Well pleasing to God. So the Philippians gave and supported the Apostle Paul as an act of worship. Amen. Why do we have the offering plate in front on this table? And we don't have it in a box in the back. We don't pass a plate around. Why is it done theologically on purpose that it's up in front? And this is something, and for those of you that don't know this, that's okay. We're all learning. And, and this is what we need to learn this morning. When you bring your offering up, I would encourage you that you in your heart of hearts, whatever that amount is, that you come up out of worship to Christ. It is symbolic. And, and symbols are very important in the Bible. That you are walking up to the altar to saying, Lord, this is out of worship to you. That you, I am content in Christ. And yes, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills at the end of the month, but I'm going to put your kingdom first. I am content that you have said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So Lord, I worship you by my offering. And I, I, I physically act, I get out of my chair, and I go walk to the front, and I leave my offering and return to my seat. Remember Hebrews 13, 16, And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with, with such sacrifices God is pleased. Notice the word sacrifices. 2 Corinthians 9, 7-8, Each one must do just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. So do you see the connection between material giving, providing for other people's needs, and the spiritual enriching, the abundance of what it produces in you of spiritual fruit? There is a direct connection with material possessions and how you use them for God's kingdom and the spiritual blessing, the growth in Christ that it will incur in your life. There is no separation. So it's not money that is, money is not evil. Material possessions are not evil. It's the love of those things that is what creates the evil. Amen? So there is a direct connection. And I've seen supporters that at times I have truly believed in my heart they're not truly saved yet. But they have given faithfully to the ministry. And I've prayed and prayed for that salvation. But because of their faithfulness in being generous to God's kingdom, they eventually came to Christ. Did not God see their generous and their faithfulness over the years? And that I believed, even after 15 years, I truly believed in my heart they would come to Christ. And they did. And not just the person, but many of their family members are now coming to Christ because of that generous giving in moments of great need in the ministry. God always honors His Word, brothers and sisters in Christ, does He not? Paul says, how does God do all this? And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's a mouthful. That's just one verse. Look at the connections. All of your needs, right? Think of all your needs right now. I don't care if they're emotional, spiritual, financial, material. Whatever those needs are, I want you to think about those right now. Amen? Are you thinking about them? Is the list a little long? 
how is God going to meet those needs? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Is there any deficiency in the glory of Christ? Is there any imperfection in Christ? Is there any area of Christ that is not sublime in total majesty and beauty and excellence worthy of praise? Is there any lack in Jesus Christ? Is there anything not perfect in Jesus and His salvation? So in that, all of who God is, all of His attributes, all of the glory of His salvation that angels long to look into, out of that is how God will supply every single one of your needs. Is there any lack to the fountain of Christ? Is there any shortage of the goodness and the greatness of God? Is there anything in your life right now or anything you will have in the future that Christ in all His glory and sufficiency cannot meet and cannot provide for? So when we doubt God's provision in our life, when we doubt God's goodness, we are doubting the very essence of who God is. We are doubting His very glory and His very majesty. The more you see the glories of Jesus Christ, the less likely that you are going to doubt Him, right? And so we need to see a clear picture of the glory of Jesus Christ. We need to have a simple life. And living in 2020 with all of our technology, with what iPhones do, with all of the internet, with all of the complications of social media, with all of the material possessions and what they create and what they invent, recreational toys, outdoor toys, new things for guns and ammo, and it just the list goes on and on, and it is overwhelming, is it not? And does it not bring stress to your life? When I leave my phone in the car and go into a Home Depot or something, it immediately brings relief to me. For each of us, what needs to change in your life today, first of all, to make your life more simple, because if it's so complicated, you're going to have a hard time finding your contentment in Christ because you were so stressed out. And it's not God's will for you to be like that. If you need to take a day of retreat, just go up to highlight. Even if it's a half a day, go up and do that. I might see you there. Whatever you need to do to change the routine and to simplify your life, you need to do that. Lord, and I want you to say this all, okay? Not now out loud. I mean, you can if you want. But in private, I want you to say, Lord, I have clothes and I have food. Even if it's a bag of popcorn in your pantry, you still have food, right? But I don't have any oil to cook it. No. God will provide the oil. That story of Elijah and the widow and his son amazes me. One of my favorite stories in the Bible of how God provided for that widow and her son and, and him as a prophet of God. I want you to say to yourself, I have food. I have clothes. You can extend that list. It's not in the Bible, but you can extend it. But Paul's saying, make your life this simple. I have food. I have clothes. I am content in Christ. I want you to ask yourself right now, and that's the point of the application questions, what areas of your life are you not content in right now? Well, for one, I want to be married and I'm not married, so I'm not really content. That's a big problem, isn't it? And I've said this for years in the passage in Isaiah, when, when God says to Israel that I am your husband. If a woman, and it's especially true for women, if women don't find that their true husband is Jesus Christ, they will always, always put high, irrational expectations in their husband that will hurt their marriage. That wife will never be happy with her husband because only Christ can protect her spiritually because Adam failed. Where Adam failed, Christ never will fail. If a woman doesn't understand that, she will be a woman who is always searching and never finding. And for men thinking like, oh, this woman will provide for my needs, uh, provide for my needs as a mother, my children, provide and be a good cook, provide for my sexual needs, this, that, and the other. And, and if I don't have that, I'm not complete in Christ. You will never be complete in Christ. 
And so no one should get married until they truly can say, I am complete in Christ. He is my first love. Remember God's order? When does God provide the godly man or the godly woman that you so desire? When you're discontent and you're searching all over and you're going to church college groups to find that special one? <laughs> Which is the most dumbest idea ever to do that. It's like, I have to go to that church college group, otherwise I'm going to be single the rest of my life. That is their limited view of God, right? You can marry an African, a Costa Rican, or who knows, someone from Zimbabwe, God brings up. <laughs> All the girls are like, what? <laughs> I mean, Tim Tebow married a gal, Christian gal from South Africa. Do you think he thought, I'm going to go to, when he was 16, I'm going to go to South Africa and find my future wife? No, it's God's sovereignty. God is the one that brought that together, right? That's how God works. So you don't do it man's way. You do it God's way. How many people at Moody Bob Institute, you know, their famous ring by spring, if they didn't get married before they graduated, they were like the biggest losers in the world. It's like, no, those were the marriages that were pretty bad. Because they did it their way instead of trusting in God. They had their timetable, right? Instead of God's timetable. And God is a mystery. We trust in God's provision and His way. But He will not provide. If He does, it will be a curse to me. But when God provides in His way and my heart is right, there is no regret, says Scripture. Amen? There's no remorse to it. So my heart is content in Christ. And all of a sudden, God blows me away with a gift that I know I don't deserve. That is how God works because you were content before it. God knows that that gift is not going to destroy your heart. That if you are content in Christ now, He is going to do what? He is going to use that gift to bless you spiritually and grow you spiritually. And it's not going to become a weight on you. But when we do things our way, it eventually becomes a great weight on our souls. And so looking through those questions, is there anything that's prohibiting your contentment in Christ this morning? Is there anything that right now in prayer, before you leave this morning, before we sing the last song, you say, Lord, I, I, I've not trusted in this area. I've not realized how much discontent and complaining is in me. And that, Lord, if I think if I just get this, it will change everything and I will become a happier, more fulfilled person. It's confessing, Lord, I'm, I'm believing a lie. I'm believing a lie, and I, I, and I ask you to please forgive me of that right now. So please, every one of us, bow our heads and close our eyes. And just in this time of silence, saying, Lord, Lord, I need you, and, and I want to experience what the Apostle Paul experienced. I want to learn what he learned. And, and I need to learn to be more and more content with the simple things, Lord, that really are everything. That, Lord, my needs are actually very, very few. And the more I get conformed to the image of this world around me, the more I think I have needs that actually don't exist. And those false expectations make me complain and have a bitter heart. And I begin to doubt you and to fail you and to follow the things of the world instead of the things of Christ. Lord, I confess my, my utter needs that more than anything, more than even food and clothing, Jesus, I need you. I need to fall in love with you. I need to know that you're my perfect spouse. You're my perfect father. You're my perfect friend. You're my perfect Lord. You're my perfect Savior. So right now in the quietness of your heart, whatever bill, whatever debt, whatever thing that's stressing you, causing you pain, robbing you of peace and joy, our God is so good that He wants to hear from you. And He wants to fill your heart with His peace and joy. He wants to remove all the obstacles so that you can experience that intimacy with Him. 
Whatever it is, lay it before the feet of Christ.